everyone, if we could take our seats, please. Brilliant. So it's my pleasure to introduce the PlayStation Studios Creative Arts team for their talk on mixing in AAA games. Give them a big round of applause. Hello, everyone. Well, um, as introduced, we're talking about mixing AAA games. Um, this talk is going to be focusing on our process around how we collaborated with each other to kind of build out our mixed workflow and our systems, so we'll get to it. Uh, please turn off your mobiles, just a quick reminder, and this is us. So I'm Jody Kupsko. I'm one of the dialogue supervisors in the creative arts group at PlayStation Studios. Um, we have a centralized sound and music team where we get to work with so many different developers on helping them with their audio and their games. And Alex and Sonia are here joining me as well. Um, Sonia is one of our music designers. She has led many projects with music integration and collaborating with composers to get the vision of the music and the soundtrack executed in game. And Alex is one of our senior sound designers. He's also a phenomenal mix technician, and if you have ever questions about how to execute anything with implementation, Alex is our guy. So what are we covering today? A bunch of different topics. Um, and we'll have time for Q&A afterwards, and you can come find us out and about at the conference if you have any additional questions. Um, so yeah, let's, let's get going. So Rob and Loic from our group have talked about mix in previous years. I definitely, we recommend you go take a look at their presentations. So this mix, or this talk, you don't, you, you don't need to see their previous mix conversations. It's standalone, but it definitely complements them. So if you have a chance, go, go check out their previous discussions. Um, they're really quite good. Uh, one through line through all of these topics, you'll, or conversations, you'll see our creative mix principles. It's something we try and really highlight and follow on all of our titles at PlayStation Studios. Um, it's the lenses through which we uh, evaluate all of our game mixes. And those four lenses or principles are clarity. Um, we want our experience to be understandable to the players at all times. Uh, impact. The mix, we want it to support a dynamic and exciting experience. Uh, our games are very dynamic. We want our mixes to reflect that. Uh, immersion. The player should be continually immersed in the in game environment, and we don't want them pulled out of that by any transitions or glitches or bugs. And spectacle, uh, those kind of big wow moments that we love to make and make sound awesome. Um, and we also really want to focus our mixes on highlighting the storytelling from all of our games, as well as the gameplay systems to really create that cohesive and engaging player experience. Cool. So uh, while we like keep in mind all of these principles while we're mixing every game, uh, the high level vision of each game is very different. So for example, the most recent project we uh, all three worked on is God of War Ragnarok. So this pillar looks something like this. It's about a very intimate narrative. It's about nonlinear exploration, expressive combat, all in the service of character growth. And we want to make sure that the mix supports this vision. But some other PlayStation titles um, might look a little bit different. This is, for example, some of the pillars for Ghost of Tsushima. So we have um, the traditional combat mixed with the dishonorable guerrilla tactics and also building this like time machine where you're in rural Japan. So the mix is going to look a little bit different for that, even though we're keeping the same principles. Um, another example from another game, Returnal. This uh, pillars look a little bit different. Cosmic horror, time loop distortion, emotional story of loss, again, it's all through a different lens. So we want to honor always the original vision of the game throughout development and carry that all the way through the mix. And that's just various game to game. So some things that we keep in mind with that, first of all, communication and collaboration. I mean, it goes without saying, we collaborate extensively between the three of us um, or the three of our teams, uh, but we also really collaborate and communicate with the developer and the creative director or any other like directors that need to be involved in these conversations. Again, all in service of that high level vision. Um, we also 
like to spotlight different disciplines at different times. And this might be in cinematics, might be in some gameplay moments. We just all have an understanding that not all three disciplines need to be 100% all the time. There's a spot for everyone. Um, which just brings me to, you know, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And every time we step into that mixed room, we all understood that, you know, egos need to be set aside and we're just all a team, you know, we're just all a team. We're just all team players. So those high level visions and principles are going to carry through kind of our presentation today. And um, our overall mix process is, is pretty simple. Um, we do a pretty heavy emphasis on our premix, uh, and we'll get into some of those details and examples in a moment. But each group will work kind of individually, really getting the framework and the groundwork laid out so we're ready to go and be as efficient as possible in that final mix process. So our final mix, we will all get together, so all the stakeholders involved in that, that final mix, and do a playthrough of the game, or as much of it as we can and work together to execute that final mix and uh, oral experience that we're targeting. Once we get things sounding the way we want them to or are happy with, we bring in the director stakeholders, uh, if they weren't previously a part of that experience, and get a final sign off with them. Um, just make sure everything is executing on their kind of final, final vision. And then we'll do our mastering pass just to make sure that all the platform, listening platforms are represented, um, any sort of final polished tweaks we can get to are taken care of. Oh, I'm dialogue, that's yeah, right, that's yeah, what I do. Yeah. <laughs> we know what's happening up here, it's great. <laughs> Pay no mind. Um, setting great examples and building confidence. Uh, so premix, actually with dialogue, so our premix process starts kind of at the very beginning of production. It's more of a pre-mix, pre-pre-mix. Um, we'll set up monitoring and listening standards for the whole team, um, regardless of what listening environment they're working from. And that's incredibly important with so many people not working from home. So we want to make sure that everybody has confidence in what they're hearing, uh, especially with dialogue, since it's a core foundation of a lot of what we do when we mix around. Um, We've also, at PlayStation, we're trying to standardize a lot of our performance intensities and uh, loudness targets for mastering. So across our games, we're standardizing our mastering process, uh, at what levels we're mastering different intensities of dialogue for, and using that language so we can all jump from game to game and get up to speed quickly. And all of our titles, we go into it knowing how the dialogue is supposed to sound for players at the end of the day. When we go to author our content in middleware, and in this example in WISE, we're using a lot of metadata to help us organize content and mix quickly. Our games are getting ridiculously large, and we don't really have time to kind of go through and fine tune um, things that we may have been able to do 15 years ago when games were a little, little smaller and a little more contained. So we're using in our asset databases a lot of metadata that we can then carry over into our middleware to help group and run queries and target different levels and just really kind of mix on broader strokes and get things 80% of the way there a lot more efficiently. So big fan of metadata. We also use uh, file naming conventions that will help our efforts as well, knowing how we want to mix and hear the content offline so we can execute those mixes and go through the content in that player experience order. Um, throughout production, we'll also start setting up attenuation presets for different types of dialogue. Uh, we try to not go too granular at this level and keep them kind of high level again so we can do broad strokes early on. Uh, this also helps us maintain a quality mix throughout production. A lot of our teams they like to play test and get a lot of user feedback throughout production. And if we can maintain kind of a base quality mix throughout production, that helps them not only get great material from their play testers, but it helps inform us as to what our final targets are going to be at the end of the day, a lot earlier in production. When we actually get to our premix phase now, um, what we'll do is we'll set up reference assets. Having mixed targets and running meters is, is great, but things vary are vary and deviate um, just kind of based on the nuance of individual performance. 
So we'll get reference from our main cast and have them available in our middleware. So as we've got one or more people doing premix passes, we can play back the reference and make sure that our ears aren't deceiving us and we're sitting in the pockets. Um, and what's great about that is some characters might do conversational dialogue rather quieter. Example of Kratos. Not, not a very shouty guy outside of combat. Pretty soft-spoken until he starts yelling at Atreus. Um, but then someone like Mimir or Sindri, they're louder in general. So we want to make sure our mixed targets target the character's performance, and we highlight them. So having that reference available um, just gets us into the story and the characters, and we're not focused on just the numbers. And it makes just for a, a more cohesive experience across the board. At this time, we'll start to do leveling passes on everything, although we have pretty good um, mastering targets. Again, the, the, there's very variances in performance that we want to make sure that we're aware of. So we'll play through content in player experience order and do it rather quickly just to make sure it flows naturally and we don't have lines spiking um, in the middle of a conversation, especially if we didn't get the chance to record those actors together. So we'll, we'll go through and make these kind of fine tweaks and get everything as close as we can before we do that final mix playthrough. And then we test it all in game. Um, we can do a lot of work with this process offline and do it quickly. But at the end of the day, we have to be playing the game. We have to know the context that all of these lines are playing in. And we have to make sure it works in the game. So playing the game is a theme you will hear as we go on, it's it's very important to us. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so that brings us to the oh sorry, the yeah. sound effects section of things. Uh, sound effects are a lot more varied. You know, there's a lot of different kinds, and the amount of assets can be staggering, especially for these larger AAA games. So one thing we do, similar to dialogue, is to make sure all the designers are trying to listen at the same SPL level. When we're all in office in treated rooms with similar hardware. It's a lot easier for everyone to be calibrated to listen at a specific decibel level. However, you know, during COVID and also now with remote work being a lot more commonplace, a lot of folks are listening to things on their headphones in their own home rigs, and things can differ for sure. So we want to try to find a way to make sure that everyone is playing the game at the same level to make sure that they're hearing what everyone else should be hearing on the team. One way to do this, even without being for sure if they're listening at the right level or not, is trying to to generally define what the upper limit would be for the loudest thing in the game. You know, in God of War, there's lots of loud sounds, you know, lots of AAA games, you blow things up, et cetera. So we want to try to try to see at this listening level what's our max limit, just to make sure we're not, you know, blowing people's eardrums out. No one, no one, nobody wants that. Um, but also on a more granular level, we want to make sure that we define some rough loudness ranges for different sound categories. So ambience should be sitting between you know this decibel level. In this decibel level, VO has their own, and for sound, you know, we've got a lot of different categories. So just to make sure things are roughly in the ballpark before we go and do a more polished final mix pass. Um, and this is a little bit more wise specific, but setting up your HDR slash voice volume value hierarchies is also very important. If you think about your HDR, not in terms of pure loudness level, but more how important is the sound, this also might help inform how things sit in the mix before you even get to that final mix stage. And like Jody said, playing the game, super important. It might sound great in your DAW, it might sound great in your middleware, but then when you go in game, there could be a bunch of other factors affecting this, dynamic mixing, in-game reverb, et cetera. So we want to make sure that everyone is checking their work in game to make sure it's sitting well with other reference sound effects, reference voiceover, even music. And one of the ways we can help sound be a little bit more reliable in this behavior is to create, create kind of groups of attenuation presets just to make sure that per category sounds behave and fall off in a certain way. But there's also other sorts of settings that we can inherit, such as EQ fall off over distance, you know, various other things, just to make sure that when players drag, when creators drag their sounds into the game, that things are just kind of behaving like they should without a lot of effort. So here's an example of an HDR voice volume hierarchy range spreadsheet we set up. Um, just to kind of get a sense for, on the relative scale, how things maybe should be sitting you know, amongst each other to kind of give us a better high-level overview. But then on a more granular level, we can actually define you know, what these voice values should be. 
And this is all set up by sound designers and comes through by various people just to make sure things were all set up correctly before we even take it to the mix stage. Yeah, so for music, like just like Jody and Alex have said, loudness targets, super important. Um, for us, we're basing it based off content. So we, for example, have different targets for exploration, different combat intensities, even boss fights are their own thing. Um, and with that, we just collaborate, you know, internally as a music team and with the audio team to like make sure those targets are right for each game. With music, um, depending on like the music style, um, something might be perceived uh, louder than it actually is. So orchestral music has a different mix versus, you know, let's say electronic music completely. So that's, that's what we need to keep in constant collaboration. And we actually rely on dialogue to keep us grounded as we're testing in the game and we're checking this loudness targets to make sure that we're always uh, listening to dialogue and music is never bearing um, dialogue. We appreciate that. <laughs> Um, so we also have folder structures. Um, this might sound like a bit, a bit basic, but the reason why we structure this like so um, simple in, in a simple way is because we know anybody could be driving the mix and we don't want to be like stuck uh, just because nobody can find like where things are. So we usually go per location or level as it makes sense uh, for the project. We also sometimes have interactive layers and those can have different bus needs and also different loudness targets. So for example, layer one might be an exploration um, content, but combined with layer two, it makes like a combat low intensity. So we need to make sure we're actually hitting the targets that we need to, even with that um, added variation. Um, then we also adjust the content after playing the game to find the right pacing. So sometimes we go into a game, into like level and we put music in and maybe like ambience is not like a hundred percent there or maybe there's some VO missing. So we like right before we do this final playthrough while in this pre-mix stage, we run through the game one more time and check for pacing specifically for content, make sure that music still makes sense. There's not too much music, too little music, find the right balance. So one of the big ways we can ensure that we, this mix is even possible in the first place and facilitated is through having a good bus structure. You know, this example also uses WISE, which we use quite a bit. Um, but one really important thing to keep in mind is it's really good to designate a specific owner or gatekeeper for the bus system in general, because everything in the game is running through this pipe. And if there's multiple people changing things, all this behavior is codependent on each other and it can really muddy things up if there's a lot of changes happening. So it's good to have one person just overseeing it to make sure that things are running smoothly and there's no changes being made that could affect the game on a more holistic level. Um, it's also good to communicate with other audio departments to figure out what their needs are. Let's say if the owner of the bus structure is someone on the sound team, this person needs to be making sure they're keeping in constant contact with stakeholders on the music and dialogue teams just to make sure that their needs are being met for the content they have to make sure that everything that they need is available for them to use. And this is a constant process. Um, it's also really good, at least at first, to set up your bus structure for working on broad strokes. There's an analogy that Jody taught me. It's like, if you're trying to paint a whole room, you're not gonna get out this tiny little paintbrush. You're gonna get the paint roller, do the whole thing. And if you wanna paint some nice details later on the molding or whatever, you get the small one. So, you know, maybe you can set things up for kind of the big knobs per se, but then later on, if you need something more specific for a certain part of the game, then go ahead and add things that are gonna be working for you. You don't wanna start backwards and make things too complicated off the bat. It's also good in general, just to have really straightforward naming conventions. Anybody should be able to walk into the bus structure and look at it and see why things are where they are, what should be assigned where, and then have things inherited in a way that makes a lot of sense for the average person to look at and understand the flow. Also, color coding is a lot of fun. Sometimes you're in the thick of it and you don't want to read words, letters. What are those? So just having color set up just to make sure that like, you can just quickly visually check where things are going is a huge plus as well. It's a small thing, but it goes a long way. So this is more specific to the sound effects section, a little more complicated. But what we normally like to do, again, in WISE, is to kind of split things out into two segments initially. We have our HDR structure and our non-HDR structure. There's a lot of stuff that we don't really want participating in the HDR system, like non-diegetic content, especially things like cinematics and HUD. So we'll leave those out, but then most of the sounds in a game that are diegetic will be taking place with the HDR flow. 
Um, then from here, we can usually split out some sub buses, not only based on category, but based on mixed state usages. So if I know, for example, I'm always going to want to turn down these ambient sounds when combat starts, perfect. Let's just make a bus for that so we just have a one-stop shop to take care of that situation. But also, for 3D audio, want to split out buses according to their output behavior. With newer versions of WISE, it's a lot simpler to do this now, but essentially certain sounds within the same category might need to have different 3D audio behavior once that's enabled. So we for, further split things up just to make sure that it's behaving the way that we expect it to in that situation. Um, for example, one thing we did on a recent project is make sure that our character, which includes enemies and uh, friendly alike, are granularly split out to take advantage of things like complex runtime gameplay systems and we just try to assess our needs in real time. We didn't always have it split out that granularly, but the more we mixed, it's, oh, it'd be really cool to do this. Then you can add whatever you need, like I said before. Here we go. And yeah, just to reiterate, having an owner for the bus structure and setting up a lot of those mixed states if you're working in an environment like WISE is great. Uh, Alex and I collaborated for a good year prior to mixing of making sure that that whole foundation was set up and we, were, we weren't creating too many redundancies so we could keep things really, really efficient. And Alex taught me a lot about things we could do in WISE that I did not previously <laughs> know, which is a huge bonus. Um, so with dialogue in our bus structure, we really try and, again, structure that around types of dialogue. Um, we'll uh, split out our efforts from our spoken words to uh, facilitate different systems we might be setting up in different projects. Um, we'll do side chain ducking potentially. Um, we'll set up breathing systems if the game calls for it, different combat systems. So having those separate helps with those mixes later on. Um, if a project calls for something like ambient VO, we can also treat that differently and set up those buses so we can duck those conversations and have the player focus on the kind of high priority dialogue of that moment. Um, in a lot of games, what we're doing now, we're also setting up an LCR bus. Um, this helps us maintain spatialization of the dialogue, but keeps it forward facing in the mix. So that helps with clarity. Uh, it helps us, again, have that clarity while we maintain immersion, uh, adhering to our overall mixed principles. So kind of making allowances in some areas to, just to try and keep that quality high across the board. And in a lot of our, our games, we'll lock player VO to the center channel for that kind of core gameplay experience. Again, just to help with clarity and get it out of the way of the rest of the content that's happening in that surround environment. All right, so on the music side of things, we also set up things up similarly by type. Um, so kind of the things that I've been talking about, they kind of reflect uh, pretty closely to the bus structure. We want, for example, to keep cinematic music separately because we don't want any systems to affect that. I want it to like play as they are because they're typically mi mixed outside of WISE in this case. Um, but for example, for gameplay music, we actually want that to be split even further so we have more control. So we usually use pairing buses in those cases, like for example, MUS Combat would be a pairing bus that has most of the dynamic EQs that would like duck some frequencies in the music um, to leave space for sound effects. But you know, also we want to like keep, for example, like moods separately, something like that. So like that can be ducked when there's VO because that doesn't need to be like as present. So all of this allows us just more flexibility as we go into dynamic mixing. And we also just have the flexibility to add buses as we need them. So we had some custom moments in our most recent game, uh, God of War Ragnarok, where we actually created buses specific to the the same mission that you were in. Um, then we also have the diegetic music in this bus, uh, even though it has 3D properties, um, because obviously we needed to fall into the music volume slider and we just need to get certified. So uh, that's, uh, that's the reason why. So in order to facilitate and achieve a lot of these things we've been talking about, we you know, usually like to set up a lot of dynamic mixing systems in our games that are doing stuff at runtime. So 
we like to leverage our bus structure being a little bit more simple and easy to understand to leverage relationships between them. So having just these big, easy to read categories, we can just easily connect the dots and draw lines between things if we want things to talk to each other and affect each other in a cohesive way. So one thing we have to do is use aux buses in wise, for example, to kind of send signal just to them all the time that we're just listening for. And this just makes easy streams to tap into. So for example, we wanna know, okay, well, how loud is combat right now in general? How loud are the sound effects? How loud is the music? And as long as those are there, just ready to go, we can kind of tap into them anytime to kind of achieve a lot of stuff pretty quickly with pretty great results. So for dialogue, for example, we have all intelligible dialogue. So not nonverbal stuff like efforts and breathing, but actual VO is sent to these buses that are monitoring three bands plus the full spectrum as well. And basically, we don't always want to have the dialogue just stomping on stuff all the time because a lot of games are pretty dynamic and there's tons of quiet moments. And if we just hear a quiet stream and some wind, we don't want VO to just duck everything. It's gonna be very audible, especially when you have a lot of like broadband content that's noisy. So in order for us to kind of make things a little bit more you know, clean and immersive, we kind of figured out a system in order to scale the amount of ducking that happens depending on how loud the game is. So we're already tapping into, hey, how loud are sounds right now? And that directly scales up kind of how things operate in terms of the sound effects being ducked by the VO with these frequency bands I talked about. And all the signal that we're metering is being band passed. So just so we can kind of play through a lot of the lines in the game, kind of see where core frequencies are sitting for body and intelligibility and air, just to make sure things are cutting through in a much more surgical fashion, as opposed to just doing broadband volume ducking. And systems like this are huge. If your players can control the pacing of the narrative and you end up with like really intimate conversations about dead children next to giant waterfalls, as an example, that could happen, you know, not that it did. Um, systems like this will just keep you in that moment because if you just squash the ambiences and sound effects, you're going to you're gonna break that emotional connection to the story and characters, which is what we don't want. And we want to be able to understand them. So finding different ways, as Alex said, to be surgical about that, to maintain that clarity and keep that immersion uh, it goes a really, really long way. Yeah, it's really important to plan for edge cases because games are getting bigger and more open-ended as well, not as linear as they used to be. So making sure that this content can be delivered in a way that feels natural in any sort of scenario is important. So you always want to, want to kind of plan for disaster, basically. Um, so in order to make this happen, we just kind of take the, the meters that we're tapping into for each frequency band, and those are mapped one-to-one -one with frequency bands on whatever we want to duck. So that could be sound effects and also music. Um, so basically, you know, pretty simple. We just take the meters and just drive the gain in a negative way on whatever target bus we want just to make sure that things are being moved appropriately and we'll play the game with everything up just to make sure things are tuned appropriately so things are kind of capping off and starting out when we expect it to when vo is playing so for music you know we do a lot of the same stuff there as well but music happens pretty frequently and it's really noticeable with music when you know if you just did volume only and not frequency based, you know, and you do this big attack and the music just goes away completely, it kind of pulls you out of the game and you don't want that to happen. So we decided to take a similar surgical approach for things affecting music, but we tried to find certain frequency bands that would let sounds and VO come through without really sacrificing the integrity of the music. So we worked very closely back and forth with the music team to kind of find a sweet spot between sound effects and VO popping through enough when we need it to but not completely destroying the music because they do amazing work and we don't want to, you know, destroy their livelihood. It's not fun. <laughs> um, but other than the surgical approach, we can also create spectacle uh, and do things that are a little bit more subjectively fun. So, for example, on God of War Ragnarok, during Ragnarok, which is in the game, spoiler alert, uh, you know, you start off in this battle, it's huge, and the music kind of starts off a little bit lower intensity, but as you go through the battle, the music kind of ramps up to be really grand, really loud, and we wanted it to feel a little bit more impressive. So what we actually did, we measured the RMS of the music, but with a really slow attack and release, just to get a sense of like how big is the music right now. 
and we would essentially turn down the diegetic sounds. So we kind of had a crossfade. So when you got to the end of the battle and it's supposed to feel really emotional, we're actually making it a very music forward mix, but it happens so slowly that you don't really notice, but it kind of has this like subconscious effect on the player. Um, but since we already had these streams to tap into, super easy just to set it up in like, you know, 10 minutes as opposed to like having to do all this stuff from scratch, which is not always a good time when you're in the thick of it. So for 3D audio, it's another really important thing to consider during the mix. Of course, there's a lot of technical and content things about 3D audio, which are much more detailed. We won't really get into that because there's a lot of topics about that that are very you know, well thought out. But this is more specific to mixing. So one thing we notice is that a lot of players will play with headphones. I think probably a majority at this point do play with headphones. And at least in the PS5's case, 3D audio is on by default. So we want to make sure that that at least sounds good, right? So one way we do that is we try to determine what sounds, what VO, what music gets what spatial lane assignment. So for example, an easy one to get out of the way is to reserve a pass through for things that really are non-diegetic. HUD is an easy win, music as well, even cinematics. But there could be some other content too, like combat finishers, certain VO things that might just sound better through pass through. like player VO, for example. Now for audio objects, they're amazing, but depending on the console or someone's PC, it's finite resources. You don't have infinite to work with, so you need to be a little bit more judicious about what you assign to it. So I would try to reserve that normally for things that are more critical, things like you know enemy sound effects, enemy VO, you know, combat sound, just to make sure you're getting that good clarity and reserving it for what you really need in the mix. Also, you know, in your middleware, when you're doing runtime plugins, be aware of limitations. You know, not all plugins can support higher channel order, ambisonic format, amount of stuff, or audio objects. So when you're doing a lot of real-time processing, with EQ, compression, et cetera, you need to really consider what you're able to achieve when you're actually playing the game in 3D audio. Um, another thing, too, is you really need to maintain parity based on your channel-based stuff and your 3D audio stuff. So you could be mixing the game in your 7.1 sound-treated facility, everything's amazing, and you pop on the headphones, like, okay, everything sounds different. So you need to really early on start just going back and forth to make sure you're maintaining parity. So ideally, when a player toggles it on, but it's on their headphones, it should feel the same, but with the added benefit of having the full 360 audio experience. So it's good to think of things, not only in terms of frequency and volume, but also where things sit in the spatial field. So here's a player wearing some headphones. And that circle, if you imagine it's a sphere, and not a flat circle, is the sphere of audio around them. Those ambisonics, you know, it's not as you know, high resolution as audio objects, but let's say it's fifth order, still pretty good. But because of the processing of encoding things to ambisonics, you know, things can be colored a little bit by the process. So it might sound a little farther out, a little bit more diffuse potentially. So it's good to maybe put things there like, let's say, ambient sound effects emitters. But audio objects are a lot more pinpoint. You're not being colored by the encoding process, and they tend to stand out a lot more in the spatial field. And this might have an added benefit of making things pop out in the mix more. So enemy attacks would be awesome here, for example. And then imagine you're walking through a battlefield, but I want to listen to some tunes, you know? Listen to the great Barry McCreary soundtrack, you know? Great Returnal soundtrack. So, is good just to have that thing not be in the world, but kind of being piped into your headphones just to kind of separate it even further from the other categories. I'll pass off to Sonia for this one. Okay, so we've been talking a lot about like our mix process, but this is something that's also really important to um, all of us and that's player agency and accessibility. So as much as we wanna like craft this mix experience for all of them, we also wanna make sure the players actually have the ability to change the mix to whatever they want or need. So as you can see, this is just a couple of examples of uh, to PlayStation games that have clear volume sliders, which is pretty standard, but we actually also wanna make sure that they understand what they're changing. So for example, you can see that there's like a volume balance explanation on the right for God of War Ragnarok. So you understand what's actually happening when you change that setting, when you change the balance or dynamic or any other setting. 
So with that, um, there's also some other games. This is another PlayStation game, Returnal, where it can get a little bit more granular. So it really depends on the games. Sometimes it's just better to keep the settings simple for a more streamlined experience. Other games, you know, are for like maybe more hardcore players that might want to like tweak things further. So this is a good example of that. We also really um, care deeply about audio accessibility. And in our most recent project, um, we actually had a lot of um, audio accessibility features. So for example, the audio cues and screen readers, we actually made sure during the mix that they were sitting at the right level, but there are also volume sliders there to make that experience customizable as needed. Um, we also had audio painting, you know, left and right to create a different balance, like in stereo mix wise. We also had options to set the dialogue to be in the center at all times. Uh, but one cool thing that I want to dive briefly into is the voice boost is something we've been actually doing in several PlayStation titles recently, where we just make dialogue a bit more uh, forward facing by churning down audio that is getting in the way of dialogue. So uh, another example here from another PlayStation game is Horizon Forbidden West. There's actually an option to turn off the night of sound, which is something we want to continue like diving into as for other all of our other titles. So that brings me to where do we actually want to go from here? Um, one thing that we really want to do is try to aid a gameplay feedback with the audio mix. So make it easier for players to find chests or loot by using the audio mix. Another thing we want to do is have more coordination with wine and low vision players to create an audio experience that can be played through like without having um, to see anything. Uh, another thing uh, is misophonia volume sliders. We just, again, it's all of this is in service of making our games very accessible, especially when it comes to audio. All right, so our, our mix process is ever evolving. Um, we're constantly revisiting it and making adjustments. And throughout the last couple of years, especially with the three of us collaborating pretty closely, we've learned a lot. Um, our loudness target discussions, uh, dialogues kind of really zeroing in, in on our standards. Um, music is really starting to establish standards for their different types. Sound design is quickly uh, following in, in the footsteps with that. And it's just gonna help us uh, kind of standardize our mixed processes and really get those core foundations set early on so we can better maintain mixes throughout production and not just have to rely on it at the end. So that's something we've learned that we need to continually work on and discuss together as the multidiscipline groups and keep driving those forward. Um, and we want to make sure that we don't do those in bubble, bubbles. It can't just be dialogue and music and sound design doing that. We have to understand how everyone's working because we all play our stuff together. Um, and we're not jerks. It's great. Um, we kind of like each other, kind of. Um, we want to have better collaboration with departments outside of audio, too. Um, get out of our little bubbles in our studios and go make sure that our mixes are prioritizing not just what we want to hear or what we think the players want to hear, but what our combat designers want the players to hear or what our puzzle designers want to hear, our narrative team. Um, so talking to the individuals, not just the directors and stakeholders, but the developers themselves and get their feedback and get user um, feedback from playtests just to make sure that we're just aware of more people's input. And we're just kind of breaking out again of our, our little sound bubbles we can get into from time to time. Uh, I kind of already spoke on this is just maintaining that quality mix throughout development. Um, again, with as much as we play test at PlayStation Studios, this is something that's really imperative to us. So the more we can build systems and processes to kind of take care of this for us, uh, the less kind of work we have to pull away from um, developing the individual features uh, as production goes on. Um, playing the game in different ways. So uh, some of our games have a lot more difficulty settings and they create now wildly different player experiences that really can affect your mix. So pro tip to try those out and play them in different ways because whoo, did that surprise us at times. Um, so playing your game and mixing with the different difficulty settings, uh, keeping that in mind, and playing with different play styles. 
Some players are very kind of choppy, especially if you're like us and aren't very good at the games that we work on. And then you bring in someone like the game director and not that this happened at all, who can just like mow through everything. And it's like watching this choreographed dance and you're like, oh my God, that's great. This is insane. Well, how do we fix this? We haven't been mixing like this at all. So having different play styles um, is something else that, you know, we want to continue to work on. Um, and yeah, more, more user feedback, getting involved in those play tests and, and getting an understanding of what's important to the players and are they, getting the clarity they need. Are they immersed in that environment? Um, and using that user research to just continue to improve our mixes. Um, and this is a process that has worked for us. Um, we kind of change it up a little bit on every game, depending on, you know, does that team have a full audio staff? Do they have an audio director? Is it us just supporting the audio for the team? And, and we make up the entire audio team. Um, we'll try out different roles and responsibilities in the mix process. And just because it's worked on one game doesn't mean it's going to work on the next title. And just because these things have worked for us doesn't mean that you should all like implement everything. Uh, take away different bits and try and understand what works best for your setup and your teams. Uh, we do the same on all of our titles. So we'll, we'll try out different roles and responsibilities for this mix process kind of as we go. And... That is that. Um, that's our talk. Are there any questions? So I do believe we want to wait for microphones. There's one. Okay, yeah. we'll just follow the mic. So We're go going? for it. Uh, thanks for this. This is great. Um, are you aware of any research on um, uh, the emotional response of audio uh, in combination or in separation from the gameplay uh, on the players? Or have you experienced any situation where the audio or the music caused negative emotional response? That is a fantastic question. I won't I'll let you answer the music part. I, I know that there is that testing going on. I actually have a friend who's a PhD student at USC who kind of like focuses directly on that. There's a lot of user testing going on for all sorts of applications, even outside of video games. That's really, really cool to kind of track um, the kind of mental and emotional responses of, of individuals. So. I'm not very versed in a, not a lot of that knowledge. I, I find it very, very fascinating, and I'm excited to see how that type of information can assist us in, in kind of bridging that gap between what we develop and, and how we craft experiences and how our, our players perceive them. Yeah, I mean, likewise, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not, like, very versed specifically on that. I definitely something I feel like all of our teams should definitely look into and I think, like, yeah, in the end, we just, like, want to make games that are accessible to everyone and, you know, enjoyable for everyone. So definitely want to continue growing on that. Yeah, I just lurk on Reddit and Twitter and <laughs> hope we can patch the game later. But doesn't always happen. Super healthy. Great environments. Yeah. yeah. It's great. Other questions? Microphones. Raise your hands high so our volunteers can see you. All right, great. Uh, dealer's choice, whoever you want to get to. How are we on time, by the way? Are we, mm -hmm. we got like a minute. I'll right. keep it quick. Right. Um, okay. I was just like, do you see a kind of direction of travel towards loudness standards and or communicating loudness standards from PlayStation as a whole to I suppose, all the rest of us? And especially things like dialogue, especially with accessibility, accessibility becoming so much more important. Is, or is that something that you would champion or have other thoughts on? I, I mean, I, I have lots of thoughts and feelings around dialogue standards. Um, I'm a big fan of them just so it, at, at the very least, makes our processes more efficient. Our games are getting bigger um, and our teams necessarily aren't. So the more we standardize those experiences, the more efficiently we can work. And it, it helps us with building up more junior employees as well, having those standards. So um, there's career growth opportunities and aspects of, of that uh, workflow that I'm a big fan of. Um, and from that kind of consistency perspective, if you go from game to game to game, you want to make sure that you've maintained that kind of mix. 
um, and overall loudness. And you don't want to get blown out by, you know, YouTube commercials like we do. So, um, but again, it's, it all has to vary and deviate a touch. Uh, we do have general loudness standards for the PlayStation titles as a whole that we uh, collaborate with all of our, de of our developers on and, and go to target those overall loudness uh, experiences over like 30 minutes and plus of time. But yeah, the more we, we dig into this and the larger our teams get, the more specific we're getting with a lot of our standards. And I'm, I'm just answering these. I mean, yeah, I agree. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. See, we plus work one. well together. Collaboration, <laughs> it's great. Thanks, thanks. time for questions. Yeah, we can, uh, All right, we don't. Um, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, we're going to be hanging out somewhere, so just stalk us, and we'll, we're happy to answer yeah. any thank more you questions so you might have. Thank you. <laughs>